Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? We're back for another issue of Uncanny X-Men. We're finishing up the four-issue Genosha storyline, as well as leading into the big crossover for 1988. So we're taking a look today at Uncanny X-Men number 238. But before we get into it, if you enjoyed the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, go subscribe to my Patreon. Links are in the description. Gives you early access to everything I do. Helps out the channel. Helps to buy new comics. So if you recall where we were, the island state of Genosha has presented itself to the X-Men. They've kidnapped Madeline Pryor and uh, another woman that Madeline was working with. And they've also grabbed Rogue and Logan when they tried to stop the Genosian magistrates from stealing a baby from a hospital. They've taken away Rogue and Wolverine's powers. And Wolverine is like next door to dying uh, because of the beating that he took when they were first in prison. So uh, luckily, Rogue has a bit of an ace up her sleeve with an alternate personality who can handle being powerless a lot better than she can, which is... Carol Danvers. And the uh, the rest of the X-Men are basically just trying to find everybody because you get the feeling as soon as they do find where Rogue and Wolverine and Madeline are, then that's going to be it for the Genotians anyway. So let's just get right into this. Uh, we can start with the cover. It's a pretty good one. Not quite the kind of striking image that Mark Silvestri is able to come up with every once in a while where he's able to come up with one of the like most classic X-Men covers of all time. But definitely a good action shot with all the X-Men bursting out from what I think is their teleport field. Always a good idea to have them all coming at you and, you know, just crowding the frame with all sorts of enemies for them to take out. It's good stuff. All right, so we're going to start things off inside Madeline Pryor's head. The last time we saw her, she was being processed for genetic resequencing. And actually, now that I think of it, we did see her uh, shortly thereafter uh, when she was still in the genetic resequencing room and the doctors that had been surrounding her earlier were splattered all over the walls. So now we're going to get just a line of questioning from the gene engineer, who, who is the guy running Genosha about what they're looking at. So this was um, the recording of the psychic's investigation of Madeline Pryor's mind before the psychic was killed. But this is Madeline here. This is how she perceives herself. And you know, like, very nice drawing to open things up with. you, you got to think, how many people in 1992 or 93 could even draw this splash? Yeah, no, it's very pretty. And in her dream, she's confronted by the gene engineer. So, as I said, this is a recording of what the psychic was reading at the time. Uh, basically, the gene engineer in her, uh, in her mind's eye is uh, a stand-in for the psychic. So, her mind recognizes that the psychic isn't the one who wants to know the answers to these questions. It's actually the gene engineer asking. Madeline starts effectively manifesting a phoenix effect. And the psychic that's interviewing her or investigating her or whatever uh, basically panics. These magistrates here are, are going to be constructs that he creates to try and keep her in line. And they just start gunning her down to no effect. Her power keeps building. Uh, she heads for the, in, this is all, again, all in her mind, heads for the Citadel, which is where that ma the magistrates have their headquarters and, in her mind, nukes it. So afterwards, uh, the psychic, as Gene Engineer, is wandering among the rubble, wondering why he was spared. And wearing a Mr. Sinister outfit, uh, which I wonder how apparent that would have been at the time, because Mr. Sinister hadn't been featured very much at all up until this point. He was only introduced like uh, a year or two earlier than this. And we end with Madeline here, dressed in her completely in her Goblin Queen attire. The interrogator asks, why am I dressed like this, and what do you want? And she doesn't really seem to know the answer to either one, but she does seem to be aware that this is going to be viewed later by the Gene Engineer. So I think just wants to put a show on to end with and kind of vaporizes the psychic and that's the end of the transmission. So that's an interesting way to kick things off because I think up until now we haven't seen anything really that shows that Madeline is um, evil in any way or has like any kind of cruel kind of inclination. Uh, it, this is a case of self-defense to an extent, but then it goes way too far the other way, which, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of it has Dark Phoenix energy. And from there we flip to a meeting with all of the Head ministers in Genosha, including the Gene Engineer, and everything is just kind of coming to a head for them. After bringing Jenny Ransom back and just kidnapping this random woman, all of a sudden everything is starting to fall apart on them. Gene Engineer asks Wipeout. Wipeout is the mutant who eliminates the powers of other mutants. Uh, why he didn't remove Madeline's powers, and he said there was nothing to remove. She's not a mutant. All evidence to the contrary when she slaughters everybody in the gene resequencing room. And of course, in addition to Madeline, he's also got Wolverine and Rogue to worry about, who've also escaped from captivity. They're also without their powers, and loose somewhere on the island. And he's got to figure out what the fuck is going on, and how he can get things under control. So first thing he needs to do is go and talk with Madeline. She is still a captive. 
And there's a lot of back and forth between Madeline and the engineer where he's accusing her of being a monster, essentially. And she's like, okay, well, says you. I don't remember any of that. On the other hand, I do know that you've got a bunch of slaves running this place. And that's pretty fucked up. And they kind of go back and forth on the morality of that. This is a nice sequence here. Where even though Madeline's in the position where she's the one in captivity, she does seem to hold the upper hand throughout most of the conversation. And kind of helped a little bit by uh, Mark Silvestri here with the, I don't know, the mysterious shots of her uh, kind of covered in shadow. But yeah, fantastic stuff. Silvestri draws a woman better than just about anybody else really at this time. So Wolverine and Rogue have the Gene Engineer's son. They picked him up at the end of the last issue at the uh, end of the line, the train stop. Because some magistrates thought it would be a good idea to just kind of slap a, a, a mutate costume on him. Because he was cutting up rough in a bar. And uh, stick him on the mutant train, send him down to the end of the line, and then have him sent back. Give him a little bit of a scare. Luckily for Philip, Rogue and Wolverine happen to be on that train. And yeah, they're walking him out now. And Philip's having a little bit of an adjustment of perspective. He's been told all his life that the mutates just kind of stick together. And they, you know, keep themselves to themselves not really thinking about it any more than that and realizing that they're actually essentially imprisoned in another part of the, the island. And they're kind of slowly talking him around to, you know, like just kind of opening up his brain a little bit because he's been conditioned his entire life to be a racist asshole. That's kind of how that works a lot of the time. So it's going to take a little bit of arguing to kind of, you know, get him around on his point, at least all the way. He's, he's a little bit of the way at least, so that's all right. Uh, only on their way out, they get stopped by the Gene Engineer's second-in-command and some magistrates. So they load them back up on another Genosian hydrofoil-looking thing, and uh, Rogue and Wolverine are like, so what, like, tipped us off? And it's like, well, it's, it was actually the fact that the security cameras showed Philip walking around all by himself when the reports were in that there were a couple of other people with him. So that's fun. This feels like the storyline where Chris Claremont really kind of took that to heart. Like, he, I, I don't know if he was sure what to do with it before, and now he's like, okay, no, wait, I've got some neat ideas now. And they're coming in on their headquarters. Uh, while they're coming in, though, they get hit by some turbulence, which is not supposed to happen, and a storm starts blowing in, and uh, Rogue, I think, gets the idea of what that means. They're all going to try and rush inside, and with them getting rushed inside, we're going to cut inside. So we're going to cut back to Madeline. Who was trying to comfort Jenny Ransom, because uh, she did know Jenny at the beginning of the storyline. She was the one flying her in. And Jenny is starting to undergo some changes, because she's been going through the genetic modification process. So she's trying to comfort her. Um, a bunch of magistrates come, and they take her off for another round of genetic modification. And they're kind of, you know, just taunting her the whole way through, uh, which pisses Madeline off something awful. Uh, it feels like that's a big part of why the whole racist thing is in here is just to piss off Madeline uh, past the point of no return. All right, so Rogue and Wolverine get marched up to the Gene Engineer. Uh, when they get there, Phillip's with him, and he's going to try and argue the way that, you know, teenagers tend to do when they get a new idea. Just check out this one aspect of this topic I just learned. It's mind-blowing. Meanwhile, Gene Engineer, of course, is not moved because his position is from an entrenched point of view that has been backed up over decades, with justification and the good of the many outweigh the good of the few, all that kind of shit. And there's really no no change made here. Uh, the art seems to be speeding up a little bit here. Like, that is a very fast uh, Wolverine for Mark Silvestri. Same with this shot here, actually, of Madeline, I think. Putting a little bit less thought into the compositions. Yeah, I get the feeling he's uh, having to rush a little bit to get this one out. Um, we are switching from bi-weekly after this month, at least. So there's that. He'll be able to slow down to, like, a regular human-ass rate. So he's got that to look forward to. So Philip doesn't back down. The second-in-command and Gene Engineer keep arguing their points, because that's what they're going to do. And eventually, Gene Engineer is put in a position where he has to weigh the society he's built versus the welfare of his, you know, well-intentioned son. Because, of course, it was going to go there, right? Meanwhile, we cut to the Citadel's main gate, where a bunch of magistrates are piling into a, sort of a monorail system here, kind of like a half bus, half monorail. And they should be checking badges and IDs, but the magistrates are like, fuck that, we're out here in this storm. Get us inside and then check the IDs. And it turns out that the magistrates in question are the X-Men in this case. So they've stolen some uniforms, and they're just trying to get in. And that's the point of the storm, is to just like kind of hurry them in inside the Citadel. Back to Wolverine and Rogue. Wolverine tells them that he's uh, he's proud. Well, he's proud to stand beside the kid, 
And uh, he will not be turned into a slave. He said apparently he's been one before and he's not going to let it happen again. And that he'll die first. And kind of hunches over. But that's so that he can pop his claws. Although, of course, he still doesn't have the healing factor. So he's just going to bleed a shit ton now because of that. So he might as well get his licks in while he can. Uh, he's going to yeah, just start stabbing on some magistrates. Always a good time. Inside the squad bay, the X-Men have gotten in. So now they're going to strike. Dazzler, yeah, does her thing. Um... Havoc just starts blowing shit up all around. That's always fun. I always, I always liked Havoc. His costume is ridiculous, but I don't know. Just something about his whole thing with just absorbing energy. Like, I think it's solar radiation and then having to expel it. Like, he's a pressure valve. Kind of. I, I, I always like that aspect of him. And they're able to make a hole in the wall where Rogue and Wolverine are. Uh, so Storm, Psylocke, and Colossus fly in. Not sure how Colossus flies in. Um, maybe it's really windy. That must be the case. And back to Wolverine and Rogue. Uh, popping his claws is actually, like I said, uh, just kind of bleeding Wolverine out faster. Uh, but he's like, fuck it. I'm going out anyway. Might as well go out having a good time. And uh, leaps back into a whole bunch of magistrates. The art here is getting really sloppy at this point. Like, it doesn't look a whole lot like Mark Silvestri. Some of the lines do, but the uh, the structures, not so much. So he's having to go really fast at this point. Some of these poses are really nice. Like, these really tossed off ones. Where he's going super fast, like, I don't know. Uh, Mark Silvestri has a, has a real knack for just kind of capturing a shape of a person. I've said that before, though. So the X-Men wipe out the squad bay, and they kind of rush the main gate here in the middle of the storm. That's a fun shot, or at least a fun concept. Colossus runs into the door while it's closing, and is able to stop it from closing further, but uh, he, he doesn't have the leverage to actually open it further from there. So Dazzler has to shoot a beam of solid light at it, which blows it right off its hinges, which feels a little OP for Dazzler. I always got the impression the deal with Dazzler was like, yeah, she has some pretty powerful abilities in the right circumstances, but they're not like offensive weapon type of abilities. But that doesn't really seem to be the case. And so, yeah, once they blow off the doors, something happens that goes slamo, and uh, they won. Beachhead secure. Now what? Good question. The complex itself is shielded against Psy powers, so uh, Psylocke can't tell what's going on inside the Citadel, so they're going to have to go in and investigate. So Havoc goes in first, blows a big old hole in the wall, again, fun shit, uh, finds Madeline's cell, finds her uniform, the mutate uniform, and uh, the door has been blown open from the inside. So again, we're building up to Madeline having powers, which must have been interesting at the time, because there's no real... Reason to believe that she would, I don't think, except for her brief turn as Dark Phoenix at uh, the end of the Paul Smith run. Although even that, you know, she wasn't Dark Phoenix exactly. It was Mastermind, yada, yada, yada. So what Madeline's done is she's gone to what's called the Krish, which is where the Gene Engineer grows his babies. Um, this one here is a natural birth, one of the very few ones that was done by uh, mutants or mutates. This was the one that was hidden in the plan at the very beginning of the storyline. And uh, so, yeah, she's just kind of walking around with it while naked and getting pissed off about clone babies. And then, of course, the Gene Engineer comes up behind her. That doesn't seem like a good idea. So Gene Engineer pulls a gun on Madeline because he's absolutely terrified of her. Madeline is not scared of Gene Engineer at all and uh, kind of runs a bluff on him. Basically just filibustering until Gene Engineer's son can show up, wrestle the gun off him, and threaten him with said gun. So, and he's just looking for Jenny at this point. He's not going to be too happy when he finds her, but that's how that goes. And that is really the end of this storyline. Now that uh, Gene Engineer has been subdued and his son is kind of in control. Uh, they go back outside. Wolverine is right next door to dead, but they've managed to get their hands on Wipeout, who's the mutant who took away everybody's powers. And of course, what he can take away, he can give back. But he doesn't have to do that. Psylocke's going to do it for him. So she just kind of uh, reaches in his brain and uh, reverses his power and everybody starts to get their powers back. So Wolverine is slowly going to get better. That's a, that's a bit of a better shot of him. Still a little weird looking for Mark Silvestri though. So um, Gene Engineer's kid, Philip here, is going to take over for his dad. Uh, Gene Engineer has been ousted. Wolverine is advocating for tearing the, everything down, basically burning the entire island to the ground. Philip's like, no, we can't, I can, I can use the system that's in place for good. Wolverine doesn't really believe him. He says the system's kind of been built to be corrupt at this point. But he's like, okay, well, fine, fuck it. Give it a shot. If it doesn't work, we'll come back and we're going to mess everything up for you anyway. 
And I guess we're just a couple years out from Extinction Agenda. So yeah, maybe that didn't work out too well. Meanwhile, Havoc is going to take out the Citadel one shot. Which is, again, some fun shit. And after he takes the shot, he goes, wait a minute. Wasn't Madeline in there? I forgot to check. Uh, but luckily she runs up and smooches on him. So um, I guess they're a couple. I haven't seen any evidence of it before this, but I'm sure it got snuck in. As far as I remember, he was with Lorna. He's always with Lorna. But, you know, this was one of his on-agains with Lorna. I don't know. I guess not. Um, Phillip's here with Jenny. Jenny's got no hair, and she's kind of built like a tank now. So, um, and I, I'm guessing her brain has been uh, kind of changed, unfortunately. Uh, Gene Engineer is still around, and it looks like uh, he's not going to get imprisoned or anything like that. So... That's probably not going to work out too well for the uh, the island either. But yeah, just kind of a final threat before they go. You know, better turn shit around or we'll come back and we'll mess you up even worse. And that's it for the Genosha storyline. So as a storyline, it's okay. Um, the events themselves, not exactly earth-shattering, but they do uh, accomplish a fair bit in terms of setting things up. So for one thing, they do introduce the new villains of Genosha, the Magistrates. All that, uh, that can be used again in future now. They've established the Genosians as, like, the worst people that you can possibly imagine. Like, racist, baby-stealing slavers. Which is going a little overboard. You can usually pick one of those, and that's enough. But, sure, why not? Chris wanted to go all three. He'd just seen Lethal Weapon 2, and he was like, diplomatic immunity, my ass. And on top of that, it also pushed Madeline to the edge, where... She's uh, seeming much more dangerous than she was even at the beginning of this storyline. She was still kind of a normal person at the beginning here. And it did feel like kind of a natural progression for her character to just get more and more sinister, to kind of pick a word. So next time, when we take a look at Uncanny X-Men number 239, uh, it'll be the prologue to Inferno, which I've been kind of looking forward to for a while. I haven't read very many of the X crossovers before, honestly. Uh, I think the only one I've actually read in totality was the Executioner's Song, and uh, I was not left with a very good impression. We'll get, we'll see about going back around to that at some point to see if maybe I can spot some better elements now that uh, I'm a little bit older and I've got a bit more experience reading comics. But Inferno is one of those big crossovers with Mutant Massacre and Extinction Agenda, and I suppose Follow the Mutants, kind of? That I first heard about on trading cards and was like, shit, I gotta find out what the fuck happened in Inferno. So now we're gonna get to do that. I'm stoked about it. Anyway, that's in two weeks, but for this one, that's gonna do it. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notification so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. It gives you early access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and you can join the Blood Force Discord server. But yeah, that's going to do it. Thanks again for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.